Again, broad daylight, middle of the day, nice neighborhood in one of America's biggest cities. This made national news. But this didn't. I want to turn to the FBI. How many FBI agents actively participated in the events of January 6th? Sir, I can't, I can't answer that. Did any FBI agents any or FBI informants actively encourage and incite crimes of violence on January 6th? Sir, I can't answer that. Ms. Sadburn, who is Ray Epps? I'm aware of the individual, sir. Uh, I don't have the specific background to him. On January 6th, Mr. Epps is seen whispering to a person, and five seconds after he's whispering to a person, that same person begins to forcibly tear down the barricades. Shortly thereafter, the FBI put out a public post listing, seeking information on individuals connected with violent crimes on January 6th. Among those individuals in the bottom there is Mr. Epps. The FBI publicly asked for information leading to the arrest. This was posted, and then, sometime later, magically, Mr. Epps disappeared from the public posting. So my question to you, and this is, a, this is not an ordinary law enforcement question, this is a question of a public accountability. Did federal agents actively encourage violent and criminal conduct on January 6th? Similar to the other answers, I cannot answer that. As Ray Epps gets protected, dog whistles get blown, warning the nation about black men. Dystopia, you hear that word frequently. What does it mean? Picture it in your mind's eye. Dystopia is a world where the police will not protect you. They refuse. And at the same time, you are not allowed to protect yourself. So who does that leave in charge? Who runs a world like that? Well, young men with guns, they're in charge. The cruelest and most violent element of any society, the people with the least to lose, the shortest time horizons, the shallowest reservoirs of impulse control. People like that have all the power. You have no power. And that means that everything you have is theirs. That's the end of civilization. It exists in pockets around the world, Mogadishu famously. It's a play on words. You still don't get it? But if you think it's confined to Mogadishu, you haven't been to Chicago lately. This past Friday, just before noon, a 30-year-old man called Ryan King walked out of a gym in Chicago's Bucktown neighborhood. Bucktown is a former Polish enclave just west of Lincoln Park. That's one of the nicest parts of the city. Real estate websites describe Bucktown as young and hip, a place where recent college graduates who can pay above average rents might live. It's where your kids might live with their friends as they start their first jobs. And that's how most people think of Bucktown, people who haven't been there recently. But local news accounts suggest a very different reality. Shots fired during Bucktown robbery. Man shot during robbery attempt in Bucktown. Bucktown couple shares account of armed robbery. And so on and on. Many stories like this. Ryan King probably wasn't thinking of armed robbery as he walked out of the gym on Friday. It was broad daylight. It was a weekday. But then a car pulled up right next to him. Three young men jumped out and stuck a gun in his face. Here's an account from a local Fox station in Chicago. Ryan King turned into an alley near the corner of Wabanzia in Oakley to get back to his mother's apartment when a dark colored vehicle pulls up and three young men jump out. King says one of them pointed a gun right in his face, demanding his wallet. And moments later, he says a passerby saw the mugging unfolding and yelled instincts and his martial arts training kicked in. And that's when King hit one of the men with an elbow and ran off. I recently posted this video explaining the psychology behind the reason why the black image is so negative to society. When you see this clip of these three young men robbing this well-to-do white man in this well-to-do part of town, and the first thing you think that these are young black men, then you have definitely been conditioned in all of the psychological efforts and studies of the 20s, 30s, 40s, all the way up to today have definitely worked. For instance, neurologist and psychologist Ivan Pavlov is infamous for his attempts in understanding the reflexes, but probably not in the way that you think. I'm sure a lot of us have heard of his dog experiment at some point, but never gave it too much thought of how it relates to society outside of how one just may respond to food. But this study has deeper implications. Ivan Pavlov coined the phrase conditioned reflex. It is one acquired as a result of experience. 
when an action is done repeatedly and the nervous system becomes familiar with the situation and learns to react automatically and a new reflex is built into the system. My point is this, if it's possible to make an animal go through physical changes anticipating food with the sound of a ticker, is it possible for words or sound to change a person biologically to commit or to anticipate violence? You may be asking, how does Pavlov and his dog relate to the plight of the black man in society? If it was just designated to Pavlov, then I wouldn't be using him as an example. But all sciences have an element of being built upon or done away with through future studies conducted. Which brings me to John B. Watson. Watson built upon the work of Pavlov by demonstrating that by using the same conditioning tactics, you can still instill fear in a person by causing them to become scared or apprehensive of a person, place, or thing by using outside stimulus. In the 1920s, Watson conducted a study called the Little Albert Experiment, proving that a person could be trained to become fearful of harmless, familiar items in their environment. John B. Watson coined the phrase classical conditioning, and it plays a central role in the development of fears and associations. Some phobias may be due at least in part to classical conditioning. Do you get it now?